Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Paul Webley. I'm the director of SOAS. I'd like to welcome you all uh, in the audience tonight, particularly those who've travelled a long way to be here, and to Professor Jane Harrigan's friends and colleagues. Uh, it's a special pleasure to welcome Jane's partner and mother and sister. Uh, and I know that for two of them, it's the first time they've heard her give an academic lecture. So I think it'll be good fun for them to see Jane in a rather different sort of uh, atmosphere. We really appreciate you taking the trouble to be here. It all adds to the occasion that is a SOAS inaugural. It's a ceremony. It's a rite de passage for the speaker. It's a celebration of Jane's achievements and it's an enjoyable intellectual event for the whole SOAS community. And to make sure it's an enjoyable event, uh, I do need to do a bit of simple housekeeping to begin with. So do please turn off your mobile phones. This is something I always forget, so actually saying it myself uh, is a good thing to do. So, okay. And do bear in mind where the fire exits are. We're not expecting a fire this evening, if you hear an alarm, you should leave the building. <coughs> I'm very pleased to preside over this inaugural lecture. It's the first of a set of four fascinating inaugural lectures which will take place over the next month. I think it's going to be really interesting. I've known Jane principally as head of department. Uh, and we had many interactions when she was head of the Department of Economics, rather than academic. So whilst I know she's incredibly clear thinking very capable, indeed, and superb head of department. I actually don't know a great deal about her academic project. So, me for one, I'm really looking forward to hearing about the academic questions she's looked at, and particularly about being enlightened to whether food prices did plant the seeds of the Arab Spring. Professor Harrigan will be introduced by Professor Fred Nixon. And Professor Nixon was Professor of Developmental Economics development economics in the economics department of Manchester University for many years and indeed was there when Jane joined the department I guess about 20 years ago. He's co-author as many of the people here will know of one of the most popular texts on development economics and has written extensively on industrialization in developing and transitional countries. He's also published books with Jane and his most recent book published last year co-authored with Michael Tribe and Alan, Andy Sumner is Economics and Development Studies. He's also worked as a consultant for numerous international institutions. At the end, after Jane has spoken, the vote of thanks will be given by Professor Hamid El Said of Manchester Metropolitan University. Now, Professor El Said is a SOAS alumnus, so welcome back. Uh, did an MA in Near and Middle Eastern Studies, and he's published widely on the economic and political issues in the Middle East and North Africa. And when I was looking at his CV, he's published books, book chapters, and journal articles with Jane. And you will have seen outside the advert for the three books that he's published with Jane, which is really must be quite extraordinary. And looking at the titles of those books, and he has also a forthcoming book on Beyond Belief, Counter-Radicalism and De-Radicalization programs, it seems to me that really you should be coming back to SOAS. Uh, we're very grateful to them both for being here this evening, for being part of this evening's event. And to introduce Professor Harrigan, I'll now pass over to Professor Nixon. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and indeed a privilege to be invited to make these introductory comments on Jane. Um, she has a very long and distinguished CV, which I'm not going to try and summarize. I will pick out a number of points that I think are of perhaps more interest to us, and which I now realize will lead into her presentation itself. I should refer, however, to Jane's long and distinguished academic background. She's a graduate both of Oxford and Cambridge. She's a visitor from Harvard and somehow got her PhD in Manchester. I'm not quite certain how Manchester slips in with that group, but I'm very glad she did do that. I've known Jane since at least 1991. I can't remember the exact first time we met, but certainly it would have been 1991 when she joined the Department of Economics 
at the University of Manchester, which, as some of you may know, had a very strong tradition in development economics. We'd had a diploma in economic development since 1961, and if we'd been more entrepreneurial in our activities, I think we would have maintained that position. When I was making these points, I felt like somebody out of a, a Monty Python sketch of many years ago. I kept counting up the number of points I was going to make and then deciding I wanted to make more. But I think I've got the number down to five, so I'll try and keep it at five points I want to emphasize, and if I go beyond that, I hope you'll understand. The first point I want to make with respect to Jane is that she was an ODI, an Overseas Development Institute Fellow, in Malawi in 1985 to 87. And I think the ODI fellowships have always been extremely important because they give young economists and others very important experience of real-world development work. I think there's no substitute for working in a developing country. And it was once, I think, considered essential if one wanted to be an academic development economist, one really had to demonstrate one had some first-hand experience in a developing country. I think that's probably gone today now. It, it seems to have disappeared, this need for first-hand experience. I think today too many development economists can sit down with access to large databases with suitable computing power and appropriate software and churn out articles which, although they may be submitted for the research assessment exercise, probably don't help us understand much about the development process itself. And I think Jane's work in Malawi is extremely important in that respect. It resulted in a book from Dictatorship to Democracy, Economic Policy in Malawi, 1964 to 2000. And this is also a point to refer to the importance of history in development thinking. Again, I think the fashion is now to divorce history from economics, and I think it's very important that we keep the sense of history in our thinking about development issues. So that I think I'd be my, my first point. The need for specific country experience, the need for an historical context within which one locates one's work as an economist and one doesn't simply sit at a desk in the middle of a big city churning out regression results, which often mean nothing. My second point is that not only does Jane have experience of specific country, not only experience of the development process itself, but of specific country expertise. Cross-country regressions are really no substitute, in my opinion, for detailed country-specific case study work. But unfortunately, that is no longer very fashionable. Very difficult to get a publisher these days, or at least five years ago when I last tried, to accept single country case study material. Publishers seem not to like single country case studies. Although Jane's work on the Middle East and the North African economies illustrates that research funding is available for regional groups or country group studies, as long as they meet the currently fashionable criteria for the RAE and can nowadays demonstrate research impact, whatever that may mean in the social sciences, I'd like to hear someone tell me. And I would go as far, I think, as to say that, in my opinion, the best work over the past 10 to 15 years has been nearly all based on country case studies. I think there's no, no question that the work of people like Robert Wade from the LSE, um, Alice Amsden from MIT in North America, Hajun Chang from Cambridge, have produced case 
study work, country-specific material that helps us understand more about development issues and the development process than, again, my bete noire, the cross-country regression analysis. The third point I'd like to make with respect to Jane's background is that she joined the Department of Economics having already made her name in collaboration with two eminent economists, John Toy and Paul Mosley, in her work on the impact of aid, a volume entitled Aid and Power, published in 1991. This also added to her country-specific experience, I think, I'm right in saying she did the case studies on Jamaica and Guyana and later added Ghana to her list of country expertise. And the important point about aid and power, I think, is that it attempts to develop the counterfactual. In other words, what would have happened if? Now, counterfactuals and their construction have a long history in development economics, especially if we're looking at the, the impact, for example, of World Bank structural adjustment programs or IMF stabilization programs. But I think aid and power was probably one of the first attempts to generalize and popularize this, this attempt at constructing a counterfactual. And again, I think we learn a great deal from trying to count to construct a counterfactual in this respect. And, importantly, and this leads me on to another point, that um, Jane took a, a heterodox approach to these issues. It wasn't a straightforward, conventional, or orthodox, mainstream approach to the issue of the impact of aid and the impact of policy packages falling under the heading of structural adjustment. Jane's work, I think, has always been characterized by what is now commonly called a heterodox approach. And I think that's an important point, too. The fourth point I'd like to emphasize, because those of you that have worked in economics will know that there has been a major ideological battle fought between so-called mainstream and so-called heterodox economists over the past 15 or so years, um, prompted in part by the research assessment exercise, but prompted by the increasing importance, I think, of North American theory, North American practice, which has increasingly entered into UK economics departments with, I would argue, <coughs> largely detrimental effects. When Jane joined the Department of Economics in Manchester in 1991, we were still a, a very diverse department with very strong intellectual traditions and teaching and research traditions in a number of areas. Uh, I could mention agricultural economics, development economics, industrial economics, Marxist economics, the history of economic thought as areas. In 1993, a School of Economic Studies was formed in Manchester, and this signaled a major shift of resources into the so-called mainstream. And this, in turn, led to the increasing marginalization of non-mainstream sub-disciplines. And this has now led, in Manchester's case, for example, and Manchester is not alone in this respect in the UK, and indeed, there are similar developments in North American universities. Agricultural economics has disappeared. Development economics has virtually disappeared. Industrial economics has virtually disappeared. And one doesn't dare mention Marxist economics, of course, uh, or the history of economic thought. So there have been major changes in departments. Um, development economics was very important in Manchester, both because of its intellectual history and traditions in Manchester, but also because it attracted students and it brought in revenue. So it was difficult to deal with by the mainstream. But it was an unwinnable battle, which we have lost now. And 
I would like to acknowledge Jane's role in fighting that battle while she was in Manchester and her attempts to maintain the diversity of theoretical approaches characteristic of development economics, uh, at least as taught in the United Kingdom, I should think, and the policy focus of much of the work of development economists. Policy has always been an important part of the work of development economists. And I think Man Soess's gain was Manchester's loss in this respect, a very real loss when Jane left Manchester and moved to SOAS. And I think, you know, SOAS has a big responsibility here of trying to maintain a heterodox tradition within the development economics subdiscipline. And my final point is really that, that is my fifth and final point. SOAS is almost alone within the UK, not quite alone, but almost alone in maintaining a heterodox tradition in both teaching and research. There are individuals that have often left economics departments, have gone into business schools and specialised institutes that still elsewhere in LSE, Cambridge, Glasgow, for example, still maintain the heterodox perspective but economics departments are being weeded out of these people. So, my best wishes for SOAS in the future to maintain this reputation and this work. And then finally, this is my final point, I think it's my fifth point. Uh, <laughs> I've not commented on Jane's more recent work on the Middle East and the North African economies for which three books are on sale outside, in case you didn't notice. But I would like to link this as my final point to what I see as the way the media is treating the current upheavals in the Middle Eastern economies. It would be good to see heterodox economists contributing more to an understanding of the events in this region. I made this point before I knew the title of Jane's lecture, so it fits in perfectly with what, in part, what she's going to say. But I didn't know this at the time. I would like to see sensible economists, uh, by which I mean heterodox economists, uh, being able to contribute more fully to an understanding of events in the region, and at the very least, question the use of the language of development as it is being used, not only in Libya, but in Afghanistan, to justify what I believe is now called liberal imperialism, though I'm not quite certain what's liberal about it, but it's certainly imperialism, in my opinion. That is the military intervention in these countries. And I think economists do have an important role to flesh out our understanding of what is happening in these countries, why it's happening, and what could possibly be done about it. It's not just a political issue. Economists should have a role in the public debate on these matters. And I'm extremely pleased that I can now hand over to Jane and she will pick up on this point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Fred or Professor Nixon, for that um, introduction. Before I start speaking, I'm first going to take this silly hat off, um, <laughs> otherwise it's going to fall off. <laughs> and um, I hope you'll just indulge me for a couple of minutes, because I have a few thanks I'd like to say. Um, firstly, thank you very much to um, both Professor Nixon, who gave the introduction, and Professor Elside, who's going to give the vote of thanks. They've both come down from Manchester today. 
Um, Fred was very influential in my early career and was an excellent mentor for me when I was a young academic at the University of Manchester, so I think he's had a profound influence on my career. More recently, Hamid has also had a very profound influence on my career because it was Hamid who persuaded me to move away from just specialising on sub-Saharan Africa and to start doing some work on the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and I think it's fair to say we've had a very good and productive working relationship, so I'd like to thank Hamid for that um, as well. Secondly, I'd like to thank all my colleagues um, at SOAS. SOAS is a truly fantastic place to work. Fred's outlined some of the problems we faced as development economists in Manchester. Um, it's been a liberating experience coming to SOAS, and I'd like to thank my colleagues. Thirdly, I'd like to thank my family and friends, some of whom are here, and I thank you very, very much um, for coming and listening to me, um, particularly my sister and my mother, who've come all the way from Devon and the Isle of Wight. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to thank my partner, Jill, of 22 years, who I think it's fair to say, um, without her, I wouldn't be standing here today. So thank you to all of those people. Right, let's um, move on to the, the business of the lecture. Um, I'll just give you a very quick roadmap of what I plan to do in the um, 45 minutes or so I've got. I firstly want to look at the food security status of the Middle East and North Africa, um, which I'm just going to refer to the MENA region. Here's a, a, a little map showing the main countries that um, are going to be covered in my talk. So I want to look at food security in this region and some of the policy options. Then I want to look at the role that food issues, particularly the price of food, have actually played in the current uprisings or the Arab Spring, as it's being referred to um, in the media. And then finally, if we've got time, what I'd like to look at is the way in which food price issues and food security issues, particularly their political dimensions, have led policymakers very recently in the Middle East to adopt quite innovative um, and interesting and new food security policies, um, which are actually quite controversial. So those are the three things I'd like to cover. I'll start off very quickly um, with a standard definition of food security, which is taken from the um, World Food Summit in Rome in 1995. Food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Now, you may think this is just about the supply of food, but Amartya Sen, in his famous work on famines, coined the term entitlements to food, by which he pointed out that it's not just the supply of food, it's also individuals' entitlements to food, which is determined by their income and their assets, and also the price of food. So perhaps um, a definition that pulls together these diverse aspects of food security is what's sometimes been called the three A's of food security. Availability of food, accessibility of food, and affordability of food. And it's this latter point, the affordability of food, which is particularly pertinent um, to what we've been seeing happening in the Middle East and North Africa um, in recent months. As Fred mentioned, the media has portrayed much of what's been happening as a purely political uprising, demonstrations against political regimes that people are no longer happy with. But what I want to argue is that there are actually some quite strong socio-economic factors that have driven people to rebel and revolt against incumbent regimes. Now, in terms of food security, there are basically three routes that a nation can take to achieve food security for its population, enough food to feed the population, via domestic production, sometimes known as self-sufficiency, via international trade, importing food, sometimes known as a trade-based strategy, or through food aid, which is another form of imports. So three basic strategies, and I'll, I'll look at these in the context of MENA as I go through the lecture, but let's first look at the food security status of the MENA region as a whole with a few stylized facts. 
One measure of a country or a region's food security is often taken to be the food gap or the food deficit, which is the difference between the country's food requirements and its domestic production. And that food gap between requirements and domestic production has to be met through imports, commercially, or through food aid. Now, using that concept of a determinant of food security, the MENA region is actually the most food insecure region in the world, in that it has the largest food deficit of any region in the world. And therefore, it relies very, very heavily on imports to meet its food requirements. If you look at most of the Arab countries in the MENA region, they import at least 50% of the food calories they consume and of the food calories they consume, about 35% comes from wheat alone and wheat products such as bread, much of which, or almost all of which, um, are imported. And as a result of that, the Mena region is the largest net importer of cereal in the world, as the map shows there. If you take data for 2007, the net import of cereal into MENA was 58 million metric tons. That's more than sub-Saharan Africa, which had an import of 27 million metric tons, and even more than Asia, which is much, much, much more densely populated, that imported 47 million metric tons. So MENA is the world's largest importer of cereals in the world in terms of metric tons. Now, this massive reliance on imports has been building up over the last 40 years or so, and several factors explain it. One is incredibly rapid population growth in MENA since the 1960s. Countries like the United Arab Emirates, for example, in the last 40 years have seen their population grow by 3,000%. And if you look at many of the Middle East and North African countries, they are in the top 20 or 30 countries for population growth rates over the last 30 years. So strong population growth, also very, very rapid income growth after the oil boom period of the 1970s, starting in 1973, as well as extensive urbanization. All of these factors have led to a huge increase in the demand for food. Whilst at the same time, on the supply side, MENA's production of its own food has not kept pace. This is partly because agricultural productivity in the region is quite low, for obvious reasons, um, ecological and climate reasons. Um, there's limited supplies of both water and arable land, since much of the region is arid or semi-arid. So historically, there's been a growing food gap in the MENA region with increased reliance on food imports. And in fact, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN predicts that the food gap for the MENA region is actually going to get worse over the next 20 years, and that dependence on food imports will increase by over 60% in the next 20 years. The country that's predicted to have the greatest increase in its food import demands over the next 20 years, interestingly, is Egypt. Now, the fact that MENA relies so heavily on imports for, for much of their food requirements means they're highly dependent on global food markets. And this means that the region is very vulnerable both to price shocks in international food markets and also to supply shocks or disruptions in global supply. <coughs> and I've given you here a graph from the United Nations World Food Price Index the red line shows the year-on-year -year change in the food price index, running from 1990 through to 2010. And the thing that strikes you about that red line is its incredible volatility. There, are a lot, there is a lot of volatility um, in food market prices in the global market. The reason for this is that international food markets are what we call very thin in the sense that very little of the food that's actually produced in the world is actually traded in international markets. It's mainly consumed domestically. So very little of the world's total food supplies are actually sold on international markets. In addition, demand and supply for food is what economists call very inelastic, which means that very small shocks, such as shocks to supply in the form of a drought, 
get amplified into quite large price changes in international markets leading to this volatility. So the first problem that MENA faces, it's heavily reliant on international food markets for its food security, and yet the prices it faces in those markets are incredibly volatile. The second problem that MENA faces is in terms of supply. If you look at international food markets, 73% of all the food traded internationally comes from just five principal countries or regions. The United States, Canada, Australia, Argentina, and the European Union, between the five of them, account for nearly three quarters of all of the world's traded cereals. So MENA's access to food is very vulnerable to events in these five particular countries, such as, for example, last year's floods in Australia. It also means that MENA's food supply is very contingent upon countries' relationships with these Western suppliers, particularly the United States. And there are countries in MENA, like Iran or Syria, who don't have particularly good relations with Western um, powers, particularly the United States, who fear trade embargoes on food. So there's a very clear geopolitical dimension to this heavy reliance um, on international food markets, which means that food security is not just an economic issue, it's very much a political issue. Now, moving on um, to look at food security in the MENA region, there's obviously quite considerable variation between the different countries in MENA in terms of how food secure they are. And IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute in 2010, produced a taxonomy of countries in the Middle East and North Africa according to how food secure they were. And they base it on four or five different measurements that they put together to form a composite index. I won't go into exactly how they constructed their index to measure food security. But as you can see there, food secure countries are fairly few and far between in the MENA region. And they predominantly consist of the Gulf countries, the GCC countries, Bahrain, Kuwait, Saudi, etc., who, although are very highly dependent on food imports, because of their massive wealth accrued from oil, can afford to import. The other country there is Iran, not in the same wealth league um, as the GCC countries, but having more arable land per capita and therefore relying less on food imports, making it more food secure. But as you can see, even mineral-rich countries like Algeria, Iraq, Libya are classified as food security challenged. And in fact, the two countries that people generally acknowledge as being the most food insecure countries in the region are Gen um, Jordan and the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Now, if we just quickly go back to our previous slide, you will see that massive spike in food prices in 2007-2008. There was a huge spike or increase in food prices in international markets in 2007-2008. And although food prices fell back in 2009, they have again increased in the last quarter of 2010 and the first quarter of 2011. This graph doesn't go up to 2011, but I have one in a minute, where you will see we now have record highs, even above the prices of 2007-8, we're seeing a record high in global food prices. Now, most analysts agree that these high food prices are here to stay. They're not just a temporary phenomena. There are certain structural underlying factors in the global economy which mean food prices are likely to remain high. Things like population and income growth in emerging countries like China and India, changing food consumption patterns towards meat and dairy products, increased demand for biofuels as oil prices go up, limited global stocks now amongst the OECD countries, Climate change causing natural disaster. We've had floods in Australia and Pakistan. We've had droughts in Russia, the Ukraine, and Argentina. High oil prices, which are major inputs to food production in the form of fertilizer and transport costs. 
Another recent phenomena is the massive growth in speculative trading in food commodities in finance markets, whereby agricultural commodities, including foods, are seen as an asset that speculators are trying to invest in. And then finally, more and more countries in times of shortage are actually beginning to place embargoes or export restrictions on their exports of food. So in 2007, 2008, India restricted rice exports, wheat exports and grain exports were banned by Russia, Argentina, Ukraine and Kazakhstan. So it seems for, for various structural reasons that high prices of food in the global food markets are here to stay. Now, because MENA relies so heavily on imports of food to meet its food security, these increases in food prices, international food prices, have had a major negative impact on the MENA region. In particular, many people in Arab countries have faced a very sharp increase in the price of food products, which has severely affected people's living standards has increased poverty and made it increasingly difficult for many people basically to feed their family. Just to give you um, some idea of this, in 2007-2008, inflation in the MENA region was running at twice the global average, and much of that was triggered by the role of food prices in the price index. So high rates of inflation driven by high food prices. Rising food prices in the last three or four years have also contributed to increased poverty in MENA, particularly rural poverty. Approximately one quarter of the MENA population is classified by the World Bank as being poor. And the poor in the MENA region spend a staggering 35 to 65 percent of their incomes on food alone. So the poor have been very, very adversely affected by these rising food prices. You might say, well, how does that square with the fact that many of the people demonstrating in Tahir Square and other places across the region in the last three or four months are not the poor? They're the middle classes, they're intellectuals, they're students, they're professionals. Well, in fact... <coughs> sorry, I need to go to the next. If you look at what the middle classes in this region spend on food, it's quite staggering. The middle class in Egypt, I've given you a breakdown there of their spending patterns. Over 40% of their take-home income, this is the middle class in Egypt, is spent on food. So a massive increase in food prices has a very severe impact on their living standards. What's going on here? What's it doing? <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Okay, looking at other countries in the region, if you look at the United States, average person in the United States only spends 6.9% of their income on food. If you look at countries like Egypt, Morocco, Jordan, Algeria, the average expenditure in these countries on food is 30 to 40% as a country average. So you can see the food prices have not just impacted on the poor, they've had a very major impact on the living standards also of the middle classes in these countries. And in fact, work by the Food and Agricultural Organization has estimated that the food price shock of 2007-2008 led to an additional four million undernourished people in the Arab region. And it's quite clear that this has contributed to current political instability in the region. There were food demonstrations and riots back in 2007-2008 in countries like Bahrain, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Saudi, Egypt and Yemen. This is two or three years before the current uprisings. So... And I don't think it's any coincidence that it's in the same countries that we're now seeing the Arab Spring materialize. Now, following some of these earlier demonstrations in 0708, governments tried to do something to cushion the impact of rising prices. So governments in Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, for example, 
increased public sector wages, they increased the subsidy on bread, they increased direct cash transfers to many of the poor. But these measures were fiscally very expensive and they didn't go far enough to completely cushion the total impact. Now, as I say, the, the Western media, it's quite interesting in the last few months, have predominantly portrayed the Arab Spring as driven by political factors, dissatisfaction with autocratic, repressive, and undem undemocratic regimes. But what I want to argue is that there were very, very important socio-economic dimensions to what we're seeing happening now. Autocratic regimes in the Middle East and North Africa have been tolerated for decades partly because of what's sometimes known as the implicit social contract of the past. Autocratic regimes provided their populations with social welfare, heavy subsidies on food, on fuel, on housing, on utilities, secure jobs in, in a bloated public sector with lots of perks, and in return for this social welfare, they garnered loyalty from, from the population. Now, in the past decade and a half, this implicit social contract has been unraveling in MENA, partly because of the liberalization programs that the IMF and the World Bank have been implementing in many of these countries, such as Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia. And just to give a plug for our books, that's one of the things we look at um, in the books that are on sale, the way in which economic liberalization, driven by the IMF and the World Bank, has had very serious social and um, social welfare sorts of implications. And I would argue that coming on the back of this decade and a half of unraveling of the social contract, the food price rises, which started in 2007, really were the final nail in the coffin of many of these regimes. In other words, the political uprisings we are now witnessing are partly because the populations in countries like Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Yemen are fed up with repressive regimes, but they're fed up with these repressive regimes because the regimes are failing to combat price rises, they're failing to combat poverty, unemployment, and also growing income inequalities that are emerging in countries like Egypt at the moment. And I think this helps answer the question, why now? Why the Arab Spring now? Mubarak was in power for 30 years. There have been long-standing family dynasties in Jordan, in Syria, for decades, but no Arab Spring. And I would say what's triggered the Arab Spring is some of these underlying economic pressures that people now are increasingly facing. Now... One of the reasons why the Arab Spring in 2011, here's another FAO food price index. You will see the two spikes, the one for 2007, 2008, but at the very edge of the diagram, you see the price spike for 2010 and the first quarter of 2011, a massive increase in the price of food. And what we've seen in many of these countries in the MENA region in the last three or four months is very steep price rises for basic foodstuffs, things like rice, cereals, cooking oil, sugar, etc. Just taking Egypt as an example, in the first quarter of 2011, food price inflation in Egypt was running at 20%, which was the highest rate in the world. So food price rises have also played a major role in the Tunisian and the Jordanian demonstrations. For example, in January, before Ben Ali fled Tunisia, there have been riots against food price rises, and Ben Ali promised to reduce the price of staples such as sugar, milk, and bread. But it was too late to save his regime. On the very same day that Ben Ali fled from Tunisia, there were protests across Jordan at rising food prices in what was called the Day of Rage, where people demonstrated with banners that had bread attached to them. And in response, King Abdullah slashed food prices and set aside £140 million in the 2011 budget to subsidise food. There have also been recent riots concerning food prices in Algeria. <clears throat> 
Now, I don't want to suggest that the price of food is the only factor contributing towards the Arab Spring. The people who have been demonstrating have been a kaleidoscope of people coming together for a variety of reasons. But certainly, I think what's been happening with food prices has been a very, very important trigger. And in fact, there's some interesting research that's recently come out of the University of Adelaide that's confirmed the link between food prices and political instability. They examined the effect of food prices on civil conflict in 120 countries over 40 years and found that there was a very, very strong link, particularly in low-income and lower-middle-income countries, between rising food prices and a significant in rise in the incidence of anti-government anti demonstrations, riots, and civil conflict. So I think... There's a lot of evidence to say that the Arab Spring has important economic underpinnings. Now, what I'd like to do in the last part of the lecture is to argue that because of this, policymakers in the region are now radically rethinking their approach to food security. In the past, the, the key policy choice facing the MENA countries was how much do we try and produce for ourselves? and how much do we rely on food imports. And the orthodoxy, particularly from international organizations like the World Bank, the IMF, the UN, was that men should predominantly rely on food imports. One of the reasons for this orthodoxy was that MENA faces a severe shortage of water. So the logic of relying more on imports was the argument that domestic food production in the region is really not an economically efficient use of scarce resources, particularly water. If you look at renewable water per capita in MENA, it's only 17% of the world average. If you look at agriculture in the MENA region, it uses over 80% of the region's water compared to industry that only uses 4%, and yet agriculture, using 80% of this incredibly scarce resource, only contributes 12% to the region's GDP. So the conventional wisdom, perhaps summed up very well um, by Richards and Waterbury in their very famous book on the political economy of the MENA region, they put it quite succinctly, the orthodoxy. They said, MENA needs to export in order to eat. In other words, you have a trade-based strategy where you use revenues from your exports to import food. Now, the recent events in MENA, both the demonstrations partly triggered by rising food prices, and also the geopolitical aspect of food security, whereby MENA countries are incredibly reliant on a very small number of Western economies to provide them with their food needs, means that policymakers now are starting to rethink their food security strategies. They're not willing to allow their countries and their populations to be highly vulnerable to volatile international markets. In fact, there's concern in some of the MENA countries that in the future, food prices in the international market may simply become so high that it becomes almost unaffordable without heavy subsidies to feed the population. So governments, policymakers in the region are unwilling now to rely so heavily on imported food for geopolitical international reasons, but also because of domestic political factors in other words, the role that rising food prices have played in the current political instability. And a strong concept that's beginning to emerge in the region now is the idea of food sovereignty rather than food security. And what people mean by this is that a nation state should have full political and economic control over their access to food. So how are the MENA governments going to do this? If they're not going to rely so heavily on imports, what's the alternative strategy? Well, I've already argued that the strategy of relying on food production in the region is not an efficient use of resource and will be even less so in the future. Here I've given you a graph of per capita water availability in the MENA region 
looking at the first large column for 1960, looking at its decline to 1999, and by 2025, renewable water per capita in MENA is going to be below the critical scarcity level. So it's very difficult to see how MENA can substantially increase its own domestic food production. So interestingly, the alternative that's now being pursued in the region is actually to acquire land in third-party countries that are land abundant, labor abundant, and water abundant. So MENA governments, particularly Arab governments, are now beginning to invest very heavily either in buying land or leasing land in land and water abundant countries so that they can directly source their food without having to rely on imports from the international market. And in fact, between 2006 and 2010 globally, roughly 15 to 20 million hectares of farmland in developing countries has been subject to transactions involving foreign investors. Many of these investors have been businesses, corporations, and governments from the MENA region. And in fact, that's equivalent to about a fifth of all the farmland in the European Union. So it's an incredibly large land acquisition. The slide shows the area of, of acquisition. You'll see there's a particular concentration in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, some people argue that this is the third great wave of economic outsourcing. We saw the outsourcing of manufacturing in the 1980s as part of the globalization process. We saw the outsourcing of information technology in the 1990s. And people are now saying in the 2000s, we're seeing the outsourcing of food production. Now, the advocates of this strategy claim that it's a win-win situation. The investing men a country gets access to food without having to rely on international markets and gets quite a high financial return on its investment. The host country or the recipient country selling its land gets an injection of capital into its agricultural sector, promoting development and increasing agricultural output. And also, foreign investors often provide new seeds, new marketing, things like rural clinics, roads, and schools. So it's often projected as win-win. And two of the countries in the MENA region that are leading this practice are the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. It's not just the MENA region. China and South Korea are also doing the land acquisition on a massive scale. China, by far the largest, having acquired over 2.8 million hectares. But the Gulf countries and the MENA region are also investing heavily overseas. In terms of MENA governments, there are agreements in place or negotiations underway. Egypt, for example, is buying land in Uganda and Sudan. Bahrain is buying land in the Philippines, Kuwait in Cambodia and Laos, Libya in Ukraine and Zimbabwe, Qatar in Cambodia, Vietnam and Kenya. So this is a major new face of food security in the MENA region, land acquisition. And some countries are actively courting the Arab investors. Pakistan, for example, is very, very actively courting Arab governments to buy up portions of land in Pakistan in return for oil and finance. Sudan as well, the largest country in Africa with abundant water from the Blue and the White Nile, is also a big potential target for land investors. But this land acquisition in third-party countries to source food for the Arab population, which is the changing face of food security in the region, is actually highly controversial for several reasons. Firstly, the transactions are not at all transparent, and they often favor the investing country with things like tax exemptions in the host country. Secondly, there's considerable potential for labor abuse for the farmers in the host country producing the food for the investor. Thirdly, it can threaten the food security in the host country. For example, if the host country has a poor harvest, the Arab and MENA investing countries that own land will have priority calls on the country's food. It's interesting, for example, that right now, 
Saudi Arabia has recently taken shipments of rice, wheat, and barley from land that they own in Ethiopia. Whilst at the world, same time, the World Food Programme spent over 100 million US dollars in food aid, providing 230,000 metric tons of aid over the last four years to 4.6 million Ethiopians who were threatened by hunger and malnutrition. The Sudanese government has recently put out a statement that it plans to set aside a fifth of all its cultivatable land for Arab investors. Sudan is the world's biggest receiver of food aid. Another problem is that local populations often lose access to land. Farmers in Kenya, for example, and in Pakistan have opposed many of the deals that the Gulf countries are negotiating with their governments because they're losing access to land that they say they have traditionally farmed. Another potential problem is that the investor may not care about the long-term environmental consequences of the countries in which they're investing. Another problem is that host countries often have weak institutions, which makes it very difficult to protect the rights both of the local population and also the environment. And then more controversially, is this a new form of imperialism or colonialism? The head of the FAO, Jacques Dioff, recently referred to some of these projects as neo-colonialist. So certainly, there is a new face of food security in the MENA region, um, and I think a lot of new research needs to be done on these type of land acquisition deals to see exactly how the benefits are stacked up between the investing country um, and the host country. So hopefully, what I've done in this lecture is to demonstrate that the issue of food security um, in the MENA region really is as much a political issue as it is an economic issue. And that in the past, very heavy reliance on global food markets to meet the region's food needs has contributed to the current wave of unrest that we're now seeing, and it's now referred to as the Arab Spring. And as a result, both of these domestic political considerations, the desire to insulate populations from high food prices, as well as international geopolitical considerations, the unwillingness to be so reliant on a few large Western economies for your imports of food, many people in the MENA region are totally reappraising the region's food security status. They're criticizing very heavily the orthodoxy of organizations like the FAO and the World Bank, and they have a new food security strategy. Of course, imports will remain important, Domestic production will still play a role, but increasingly acquiring land in third party countries is the new face um, of food security in the region. And it is controversial and is not dissimilar to some of the controversies that are currently being debated in terms of China's role in Africa, more generally acquiring natural resources in Africa in transactions which are often not particularly transparent. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. And after all this talk about food, um, after Hamid's given the vote of thanks, I will hope you will all come and join us for some Middle Eastern nibbles and drinks um, so we can actually enjoy some of the Middle Eastern food we've been talking about. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Jane, if you want my vote of thanks, you got it. Thank you very much indeed for this fascinating and impressive lecture. And I think everybody will be interested to see what is going to happen in the future and whether this land acquisition thing which is happening at the moment will actually face the change of food security in the Middle East. I am not really here to comment on Jane's speech. I'll leave that to you. I'm here to talk about Jane's achievements over the past maybe decade or so with me. But first, I would like to uh, uh, say a couple of words. First, I am really honored, and it's a pleasure for me to be here 
for at least three reasons. One of them is what Paul mentioned at the beginning of his talk, that I am a Sawas alumni, and I'm sure you all realize how wonderful and how special it is to be back to your former institution. And secondly, also a very important factor for me is that I'm standing today in front of two of my former and most favorite professors. And I say that with all modesty, Professor Nixon and Professor Jane Harrigan at the Manchester University, where I met both of them in the early 1990s as a student, although I would like to remind that the age gap between Jane and me is only two or three years. So I'm not really much younger than she, in case you think Jane is very old. And as the Arab adage really goes, he who taught me a letter, I will serve him forever. And in all fairness, these two individuals have taught me a lot, and I am forever grateful for them. And finally, the reason which I'm here for is Jane's really distinguished career over the past two or three decades at least, which Professor Nixon talked a lot about and really left very little room for me uh, to talk. <laughs> but in addition of knowing Jane as a student, a former student, I've also known Jane at least over the past 11 years, and we were discussing this at the beginning of today. Jane thought we started publishing together seven or eight years ago, and I reminded her we actually started publishing together almost 11 years ago. So I've known Jane actually as a colleague, as a very dear friend, and as a co-author over the past 11 or 12 years. In fact, as I said, the first paper we published together was in the year 2000. And it is no secret, as Paul also said, we have three books outside, that Jane and I have actually published extensively together <laughs> on the Middle East and North Africa, and I'm not really trying to promote our books, although I think they're good value for money. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, over the past two decades, with me and with others as well, have actually uh, uh, research several areas. Perhaps she's most known for her work on the IMF and the World Bank Economic uh, programs in which she, she dealt with the economic impact of these programs, the social impact of these programs, and this has been demonstrated in uh, her work on the Middle East and North Africa, which she touched upon today when she talked about the impact of these, uh, uh, the social impact of these reforms, and then really one of the issues that raised, been raised from uh, Jane's uh, talk today is the relationship between uh, um, instability, political instability, and economic reforms. M much of these reforms have actually led to social retirement of the state in the Middle East, and perhaps we can argue that they have been responsible for the increased number in the, the poor people, unemployed, and worsening inequalities, and perhaps responsible for what are we seeing in the Middle East and North Africa today. But Jane has gone beyond the IMF and the World Bank, and she discussed and she wrote about effectively and e efficiently on globalization, on aid policies. She also recently talked about faith-based organizations and how they have started to fill a vacuum in the Middle East as a result of social retirement of the state following the implementation of economic reforms promoted by the IMF and the World Bank. And she also wrote about social capital and recently de-radicalization, counter-radicalization, and terrorism. And I think the variety of these subjects, which Jane managed to publish, by the way, articles in internationally reputable journals and publishing outlets demonstrate and reflect Jane's vigor, broad, and diverse knowledge. And at the same time, they reflect her broad and wide-ranging influence and impact in various areas of social sciences. Dynamism, creativity, and foresight, as we have seen it from today's speech, plus leadership and crisis management in the most difficult of all times that come to mind when I think of Jane and when I think of the last 11 or 12 years we spent together researching. Indeed, her leadership skills have been demonstrated in several of the projects we undertook together, perhaps most importantly was the DFID project which she led in all fairness from the very beginning until the end and which resulted in two of the three books that are outside. <laughs> at a massive discount for you today. <laughs> but as Professor Nixon really mentioned, one of the things that struck me most about Jane is her insistence and focus on depicting the world as it is, the real world, rather than relying on uh, uh, downloading 
articles from the internet or even relying on theories or even depicting the, depicting the world as it is described for us in economic and political text. Indeed, most of the work we did together being heavily in, you know, relied or involved interviews and meeting the people that mattered most, including either state officials, members of the private sector, or civil society, and recently meeting even former terrorists that graduated from some de-radicalization programs in some of the countries which have been implementing such programs. At a personal level, really, I couldn't have wished for a better friend. Jane has been a very dear, very close friend to me over the past 12 years, and this is a very special relationship because I come from a student background, and I think very few students develop the kind of relationship I have with my former uh, lecturer. I think it's a privilege for me to come today here, back to Sawas, where I graduated from in 1990. Yes, I'm much older than I look, by the way. <laughs> to acknowledge Jane's distinguished career as a teacher, as a lecturer, as an academic, and as an author. In fact, this occasion which brings together friends, families, former and current students, and distinguished scholars and authors testifies to Jane's uh, impact and influence in various areas of social sciences. And if I am really to say just one more last point for early career researchers, as we call them today, networking is important in research. I think that you know, research is becoming far more competitive and it's becoming very difficult for individual young researchers to actually publish in higher rated journals. And my advice to you is just to follow my footsteps and develop very good relations with your distinguished and favorite uh, lecturers. <laughs> and I do not really want to take more of your time. Again, thank you very much, Jane, for inviting me here. And I really enjoyed listening to your speech. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be back and to meet all of you again. Thank you. <laughs>